thank you, Baba, for your kind introduction and hello to, to everyone. Um, I will start by uh, sharing with you some information uh, about the, the CGE. The, the objective of this uh, group is to improve the process of preparation of national communications and biennial update reports from developing countries through technical advice and support, as well as to build capacity of technical experts nominated to the UNF Triple C roster of experts for the technical analysis of the BURs. The, the BUR is the, the acronym for the uh, biennial uh, update report. This, this group, the CGE, is the key technical support element under the convention to assist developing countries in meeting their reporting obligations. The CGE is composed of 24 members, five members from each of the G3 regions of developing parties, namely Africa, Asia and Pacific, and Latin America and the Caribbean, six members from developed parties, one member from each of the three international organizations with relevant experience in providing technical assistance to developing countries in preparation of national communications and BURs. These uh, institutions are UNDP, UNEP, and IPCC. And finally, one observer representing uh, non annex one parties from Eastern Europe. To meet uh, its objective, the CG developed in 2014 a five-year work program which focused on uh, five key strategic priorities. One of the, the priorities is to build capacity of developing countries to facilitate the implementation of measurement, reporting, and verification arrangements under the convention. Within these priority, actions developed by CGE include conducting needs analysis, developing, designing, and delivering training materials, conducting hands-on training workshops, using innovative tools to reach out to larger pool of experts through webinars, like the present one, and e-learning courses, and also designing the training program for the team of technical experts undertaking the technical analysis of the BURs. Another uh, strategic priority relates to enhancing the sustainability of developing parties' reporting processes, that is to say the elaboration of national communications and BURs. And the third priority relates to enhancing collaboration and cooperation with other global initiatives including uh, actions such as developing collaboration and cooperation with other expert groups and constituted bodies under the Convention, and developing collaboration and cooperation with key global initiatives, uh, like the one we are sharing today with, the, with Lola from the OECD. <clears throat> uh, in the framework of the first priority I mentioned, uh, regarding capacity building activities, the CG developed training materials to facilitate the preparation of national communications and BURs, and also, uh, as I said, a set of materials to train the TTE, the team of technical experts, uh, to undertake the technical analysis of BURs. All these materials are available at the UNF C website as handbooks and presentations and they cover uh, vulnerability and adaptation, mitigation actions, and national uh, greenhouse gases inventories. The materials uh, for the preparation of the national communications are available in English, Spanish, and French, while the materials for the preparation of BURs are available in English, Spanish, French, and Arab. Uh, there are also e-learning courses for uh, the national communications available. 
Now we will go through one of the components of the CC training materials for uh, vulnerability and adaptation assessment. This is the monitoring and evaluation aspects of adaptation implementation. Monitoring and evaluation is the fourth component of Chapter 9 of the CC training materials that are available at the convention website. And uh, integration, adaptation, and mainstreaming are the first three components of the Chapter 9. All four components are important for completing and applying vulnerability and adaptation assessments. In this uh, context, integration refers to the analysis of DNA assessment outcomes across sectors. The aim of integration is to understand the interrelationship between sector-specific climate change and the relative importance of risks to help inform impact and adaptation priorities. The adaptation section describes uh, different techniques to assess adaptation options, while the, the main, mainstreaming discussion is on tools and approaches to incorporate the vulnerability and assessment outcomes in national planning, ensuring that climate change is considered in development priorities. Finally, monitoring and evaluation is the process used to assess the effectiveness of adaptation intervention and identify needed causes for actions. Monitoring and evaluation analysis can identify the factors that have shaped the nature and magnitude of results which have been realized through specific strategies, policies, and programs. For example, monitoring and evaluation activities can identify sorry, key barriers to progress as well as critical enabling conditions for specific interventions. This type of information can not only enhance one's understanding regarding the past performance of given actions, but can also help ensure that future adaptation actions are properly designed and executed given the context in which they operate. Although monitoring and evaluation activities are most often associated with retrospective analysis, they can be useful throughout all stages of a program's development and implementation. Monitoring and evaluation activities are often most effective when they are included from a program's inception. Viewing the, the program through a monitoring and evaluation lens can help clarify key program or policy objectives, the pathways through which they will be achieved, and how to progress towards such objectives will be measured. Programs can uh, use M&E to identify whether strategic mid-term corrections are needed. Such evaluations are often planned to occur approximately halfway to a program's plan life, but they may also be needed if conditions change drastically on the ground. Once a program has been completed, it is often essential to know what gains have been made through its activities over its lifetime and which strategies were essential to progress. It is also important to identify key barriers to advancement and any missed opportunity, which can help ensure the sound design of future adaptation programs. For some uh, programs, uh, such as those in highly dynamic environments, M&E activities are done throughout the entire life of the program. While this approach is more time and resource intensive than conducting a single midterm review, for example, key obstacles and opportunities can be identified as the program unfolds, which can help to maximize effectiveness. The specific activities conducted for um, monitoring and evaluation will vary uh, greatly across different programs, but there are some uh, essential components that are common to nearly all effective 
monitoring and evaluation activities. And uh, these components are a list of detailed evaluation questions, an evaluation framework, an evaluation plan, and communication products that share evaluation funding. The, the first uh, component, the first step in developing a, a successful evaluation is uh, identifying the questions that need to be answered. The questions can be developed independently by program staff or can be obtained through a collaborative effort between program staff and the evaluator. Clarifying what needs to be learned is critical in setting expectations and would also guide the design and implementation of the uh, monitoring and evaluation activities. Uh, after key uh, evaluation questions have been identified, an appropriate evaluation framework needs to be developed for the uh, program. This uh, framework is represented uh, typically uh, either by a logic model or the theory of change. Uh, on the screen, you, you see the, the chart with a logic uh, model. It, the, the logic uh, model, it may pre-exist or may need to be developed from scratch during an evaluation. This uh, model specifies the plan inputs, activities, outputs, and short and long term outcomes of the program. Uh, inputs represent investments that are required to make the program a reality. Activities are what people supported through the program are doing. Outputs represent what was produced as the result of the activities and outcomes are the changes that are realized from the program's activities and outputs. Logic uh, models can help to articulate how key program activities are supposed to lead to a desired change. Once uh, activities, inputs, outputs, and outcomes have been articulated, appropriate and measurable indicators for each part of the model can be identified. The monitoring and evaluation framework and the associated indicators should be reviewed periodically to ensure their consistency with the overall program and their ability to address key evaluation questions. While conducting uh, monitoring and evaluation activities and analysis can be uh, challenging across all project types, there are uh, specific challenges associated with uh, the monitoring and evaluation of adaptation actions. These uh, challenges uh, in include uh, designing adaptation goals and objectives, for example, how to define successful or effective adaptation, uh, defining and evaluating success against uh, moving baselines is a challenge too. <clears throat> uh, determining, determining the contribution of uh, the, the program is another, another challenge, as well as identifying conclusive indicators and gathering relevant performance data to assist in evaluation impacts. <clears throat> Monitoring and evaluation are relevant in our activities are, are relevant in terms of both the process undertaking and the outcomes. Evaluation of the process should consider any particular uh, problem encounter during the process or suggestions for improvement and they should be recorded for future reference while evaluation of the outcomes consider the appropriateness of any predictions made. This is the, my, my final slide, which uh, presents some key elements to be considered 
uh, under monitoring and, and evaluation. This is progress of implementation of the recommended adaptation measures, including the involvement of key stakeholders and the incorporation of impacts of climate change into planning processes. And a baseline indicators established during the scoping stage are used as reference for assessment of the changes over time. And a monitoring and surveillance of the status of the potentially affected uh, sectors or systems. It may be relevant to include new mechanisms for collection data that demonstrate links to climate conditions. This is the end of my presentation. Now I give the floor to my colleague uh, Lola. She will present her, her paper. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mariana. Um, Lola, yes. I'm yep, giving you the right to share your screen, so please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so um, I think the file, the file I've, I've sent is still being loaded. Um, All right. Could you please remind me how, how much it was to, to share the screen? Okay. Yeah. In the oh, middle, yeah. middle of your screen, um, you should have where to like where the webinar information is, there should be a share screen um, icon. Oh, share my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. There, there we go. It's loading. Okay. okay. So off to you. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry about the, <laughs> the little hiccup of technology. Um, so I'm very happy to, to be presenting to you today the, um, the main findings and the kind of summary of a, of a paper that I've written uh, as part of the OECD Climate Change Expert Group, the CCHG. Um, I thought I would start by uh, just presenting briefly what the Climate Change Expert Group is, uh, because it might be relevant for, for a few of you. Um, so it's a, it's a group that has been around for um, quite a few years, and that is jointly managed by the OECD and the International Energy Agency. Um, which brings together government delegates and experts from both developed and developing countries, uh, and which purpose is really to promote dialogue uh, around the, the climate negotiations, and also, more specifically, perhaps, to enhance understanding of, of some technical issues. Um, so, so really have some, some expert discussions um, in parallel of the, of the formal negotiations. So it's not a negotiation space, and it's really to kind of promote dialogue around some issues. And we hold two seminars a year, which are called Global Forum. The next one is coming up very shortly on the 12th and 13th of September, um, and we'll focus on a few issues, including the facilitated dialogue in 2018, or transparency of reporting on mitigation and finance, um, and, and accounting of uh, nationally determined contributions. So if you want to have more information about our work, uh, please go to our website. And that's the end of uh, <laughs> my little introduction for this. Um, so today I'd like to, to focus on, on a particular paper that uh, we released earlier this year um, to support discussions at the, the previous seminar, the previous Global Forum in March. Um, and maybe just very quickly go back to, to adaptation, I mean, because Mariana's presentation has already covered this quite extensively, but I think it's interesting to come at it with a slightly different angle, perhaps. And then I'll, I'll give a sort of a state of play of um, where countries are at to date, uh, be developed or developing countries, uh, before maybe diving in a bit more into um, which adaptation indicators are more commonly used today um, and how you know how they might be an, an inspiration for um, for people signing into this webinar. Um, so just to to go back quickly, I I, I quite like the the dynamic definition um, that Mariana gave of, of adaptation ME. Um, I think for me an important thing would be to uh, really make a difference between monitoring and evaluation. Um, if you had to break it down, monitoring is really about the what. Um, and it's, you know, keeping track in an ongoing manner um, of a range of factors, uh, such as, you know, how, to what extent are the adaptation measures you've planned being actually implemented, uh, how much resources are being spent, 
um, how is the adaptive capacity of, of you know, a given population evolving? Uh, can we keep track of some trends in climate vulnerability or climate impacts? So that's really the what that monitoring is about. Whereas evaluation, on the other hand, is more about the how and more importantly, maybe the why. So this is more taking stock uh, periodically of progress to date. Um, and so what's interesting is in evaluation, you, you need to take stock um, ideally against something. So have some sort of idea of what were your objectives when you set out to adapt, uh, whether you use your resources efficiently, and you know that's also fairly subjective, um, and also whether, more importantly, your actions are making a contribution to reduce climate risk and to reduce vulnerability. Um, and evaluation is, is really the important part of m &E to ensure that the practitioners learn over time, as Marina has highlighted. Um, so adaptation m &E is, is part of a broader cycle of adaptation activity. Um, you know, it's, it's a cycle, so in theory you could start wherever, but I think that probably the most logical step um, uh, in theory is to start by assessing uh, what are the impacts uh, that climate change has on a given territory and, and a given society? Uh, to what extent is this society vulnerable, society and economy, for instance? And what are the resulting risks? So once you have kind of a, an idea of the state of play and, and how large the risks are, you can start planning for adaptation, so deciding how am I going to address those different risks? Um, and so once you have a plan or a strategy or you know, whether it's a detailed list of action or, or maybe something more aspirational, um, then you have to go, on, of course, to the implementation phase. And it's, in my opinion, where the monitoring and evaluating phase jumps in. You know, it's kind of taking stock of the implementation, um, understanding what worked and what hasn't, and also understanding how is that affecting the, uh, the climate risks. So, you know, what's working and how is that impacting um, the resulting risks? Um, what's really interesting here is, is you, you can see that m and &E is, is really key um, to ensure that adaptation practitioners or, you know, governments and societies at large can, can learn from the adaptation that is going on. And, and the purpose is really to take stock of, are we doing enough? Are we seeing a reduction in vulnerability? Um, and so without this, you know, it's kind of difficult to know where you're at in terms of an uh, adaptation strategy. Um, also, the challenges and specificities have been touched upon by uh, Mariana, but I think I'd like to, to distinguish two sets of challenges. The first one, which are specific to adaptation, monitoring, evaluation, but also are, are kind of found in, in whenever you deal with adaptation, you know, it's it's inherently uh, an activity that is context specific. So what is relevant for one area or one sector, uh, one country, one type of climate isn't going to be for others. Um, unlike mitigation, of course, there's a, you know, not a single common metric to, to assess progress across sectors or across climate risks, which makes it more complicated and maybe more recent intensive. Um, adaptation, Implementation can, can better be tested you know, over long time frames, um, and the, the climate impacts can also realize over long time frames, which makes it difficult to, to know whether you're going in the right direction. And there's also some degree of uncertainty, um, particularly when you try to attribute, you know, if I see a reduction in vulnerability, it's, it's, it's some, it can be difficult to attribute it to a particular adaptation action. Um, in addition to this first set of challenge, which is already you know, quite um, important, there are some specificities of, of national level m and &E, which is the one that I've focused on more specifically. Um, so if you try to, to set up monitoring and evaluation at the national level, um, here you have a, an issue with regards to scale, because you're covering, of course, a broader geographic scope, um, like you know, a whole territory. Um, and also, you're usually covering various sectors, so, you know, agriculture, water management, um, businesses, infrastructure, uh, and these all have their own set of challenges. One thing that um, national level monitoring and evaluation allows is uh, 
to kind of, in addition to to monitoring and evaluating specific um, adaptation activities, you can also more broadly take into consideration the mainstreaming of um, adaptation within different uh, ministries and different policies which have a bearing on uh, on the climate risk profile of a particular country. So just trying to de-jargonize this, um, you know, for instance, land use planning has a, a huge bearing on whether your vulnerability to climate change is increasing or decreasing. And what you can do if you if you take stock of adaptation progress at the national level is kind of check whether the systems for land use planning at the national level are you know aligned with taking into consideration future climate change. Um, now let's try and move to the to the status play and, and see where we're at um, under the UNFCCC in particular. Um, so interestingly, the the adaptation M&E is, is a process that has been discussed and, and recognized for a long time. Um, you know, first mentioned in the guidelines on national communications in 2002, um, has you know been the object of, of further work uh, through the technical guidelines for the NAP, um, and it's also been emphasized in the in the Paris Agreement, uh, which indicates that parties show as appropriate engage in adaptation planning and implementation actions, which may include monitoring and evaluating and learning from adaptation plans, policies, programs, and actions. Um, so, you know, this this is basically um, a lot of interest under the NFCCC and, and some kind of encouragement of parties to consider that, um, but still, of course, uh, optional depending on the you know, parties' resources and interests. Um, interestingly, this topic uh, has already raised a strong interest from parties. So of the NDCs which have an adaptation component, nearly half of them mentioned um, adaptation monitoring and evaluation. So this is quite significant. But I would say to sum things up, at this stage, a lot of countries say they're interested in developing such a system, but in practice, um, very few have actually designed a system. So I've listed here some um, some examples of countries um, and putting in, in parenthesis the, the date at which they completed um, design, the design of the system. Uh, as you can see, you know, they're all fairly recent. Um, and actually, because evaluating the adaptation policy is, is the hardest, um, you know, as opposed to monitoring where you collect information, taking stock and, and evaluating, coming to a view of whether you're doing enough or not, and you know, where are the gaps is complicated. Um, so I've, I've only you know, spotted three countries which have completed the evaluation of their national adaptation plan and strategies. And, and, and most of the other countries are either still developing the, the system or, um, or have started monitoring but not really evaluating. Um, the national adaptation plan or, or strategy. Um, also, these systems are, are all, you know, pretty different. Uh, they have a very different number of, of adaptation indicators, for instance, uh, from three for Mexico to over 100 for a few countries, such as France, Kenya, uh, Germany, and the Philippines. Um, but let's not mention adaptation indicators without stopping a minute to, to think about what types of adaptation indicators are there. Um, so here I'm, I'm suggesting to, to classify them um, according to this typology. Um, firstly, um, the first type of adaptation indicator relates to, to climate risk. Terminology, um, climate risk. Uh, several factors. The first one is, is climate hazard. Uh, create a hazard to, to a particular country. So, for instance, could be river flooding or heat waves. These are the hazards. The climate impacts are how is the hazard actually affecting economy and society? 
So in this example, you know, that would be the economic damages that are caused to households from, for, from flooding. Um, these are just examples. Obviously, there's lots of, lots of others that you might be thinking of. Um, interestingly, when you want to, to understand um, climate impact, then you're kind of look, looking at um, a posteriori. So if you've had a, a flooding or a catastrophe happening, then you can take stock of, okay, what are the, what's the damage? Um, to what extent has my country or economy been affected? Whereas if you want to, to be a bit more forward-looking and, and plan ahead, uh, you'd need to consider the exposure. So you know, what's the proportion of my houses or businesses which are located in an area which is at risk of flooding? So how do you define flooding? Is it an event that is supposed to happen one in 200 years, one in 500 years, one in 75 years? Uh, that kind of depends on the information you have on hydrology. Um, and in addition to exposure, the, the, final, uh, the final indicator relates to vulnerability. So, you know, of those houses which are located uh, in the floodplain, so potentially at risk of flooding, how many of them have property level flood protection measures or how many of them might be protected by a dam? Um, so this Basically, understanding the exposure and vulnerability um, is, a, is a good way to see where you're at with regards to flood risk or you know, any climate risk that you choose to focus on. So that was kind of the, the risk side of things. Uh, the, the pendant of that is the adaptation action, per se. And here, you could either focus on the processes, um, you know, which are, uh, for instance, again, Going, going through with the, the flood example, uh, how much of the floodplain is, is covered by land use planning regulations which take into account the flood risk? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, land use planning is a, is a really big way to, to ensure that um, you know, an important policy to, to, to mitigate the risk from climate change. But that's, that's only the, the process. So it could be do you have a regulation in place? Uh, have you appointed responsibilities? Uh, do you know who's doing what? Whereas if you look at the outcomes, um, you're kind of looking at how have the processes actually led to a decrease in climate risk? Um, and this is you know, often very hard because you're trying to estimate, okay, for instance, in that case, how many flood? How much flood damages have been avoided because the land use planning regulations have been actually implemented? Um, but basically, it's you know it's probably easier at first to start by uh, by tracking processes, which it, which are about the implementation of strategies and plans, um, rather than the outcomes, which are about the results of these policies and plans. Um, I think in the in the tiered system that. Um, that Mariana's presentation featured about uh, you know inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Uh, you know there is some overlap uh, to that extent. Um, but interestingly, of course, M and E is is not just a, a suite of indicators because while these um, are helpful and and even necessary uh, to some extent, if you want to. Um, you know, take stock of adaptation progress. Uh, it's only it's only the start. The, the really hard part and the interesting part is to to do the interpretation of those indicators and and really try and understand. Um, you know, is is vulnerability increasing or decreasing? Is that the result of a plan or a policy in place? Should that plan or policy be be um, amended to better reflect the the climate risks? Um, so, in effect, these are, are pointers to get started on understanding how climate risk affects the territory and how a government is trying to respond to them, uh, but they're only the, the, the start, so to speak. Um, so, I'd like to conclude by just um, highlighting three takeaway points. Um, you know, as we've seen, the, the m and adaptation is, is increasingly recognized as a key step uh, in the adaptation process. Um, and so at the moment, there's no requirement to set up such a system, but you know, we noticed that many countries are planning to do so. 
However, the, the state of affairs to date is that there are few countries that have such a system and even fewer still that have completed an actual evaluation of their adaptation strategy. Um, so that means there's, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to learn from, from others' experience because um, even casting a, a broad net, um, it's, it's not something that is um, really developed that much at the national level. Um, but of course, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of monitoring and evaluation taking place uh, at the adaptation project level, uh, which can also bring some, some lessons. So I'd be very curious to hear about uh, participants, and, and I look forward to having some questions about more specific things that I haven't had time to cover in the presentation. Thank you very much.